We have traveled to beautiful Beverly Hills, California to talk with a man who was probably most responsible for uh, making the most out of a non-visual area of radio by putting so many special pictures and programs on on radio. His name is John Goodell, and we're happy to be out here to visit with you. Thank you, Chuck. I'm happy you're here. You you were responsible for producing such mostly visual programs on radio as Truth or Consequences and uh, People Are Funny. No, Truth or Consequences was Ralph Edwards. But you were involved in that. I no, no, no not, in, uh, not in Ralph Edwards. We started our show. Matter of fact, it was called Pull Over Neighbor. Mm-hmm. And it was on the coast. And it started in June 5th, 1938, uh, here on um, the Pacific Coast on NBC. And Edwards' show started in 1940, coast to coast. Mm-hmm. So we started two years earlier, but he was on coast to coast before. And ah. we didn't use the title People Are Funny until 1942. Matter of fact, I got into the visual radio business, as you mm-hmm. say, by accident. I was doing uh, dramatic programs for Forest Lawn Memorial Park. And, cemetery. Uh, cemetery, uh-huh. yes, here in uh, Southern California. And I did a lot of uh, biographies, and I was in the library downtown looking up the name of Garfield, and by chance, out of context, a book next to Garfield was Games, G-A-M-E-S. I don't know what Mm -hmm. it was doing in that section of the library. It wasn't supposed to be with biographies. And I pulled it out and looked at it, and there were parlor games. And I got to thinking, well... Maybe there should be some parlor games on the radio, a little wilder than... At that time, there were only two uh, people programs on the air, the Mm -hmm. Vox Pop, which Wally Butterworth and uh, Parks Johnson talked to people Mm -hmm. at different factories, and they're just plain interviews, and Professor Quiz. And there were straight talk shows. So I was looking at these silly games, and um, I said, well, maybe this is the way radio should go. And on the very first program which was called Pull Over Neighbor. Um, There's no reason for it to be called Pull Over Neighbor, actually, except that I inherited a two-week-old quiz show about traffic safety in which there was a (laughs) cop that says, Pull Over Neighbor, (laughs) you know, with a motorcycle, and I will give you a traffic quiz, and if you pass, you get $12 Mm -hmm. or something Mm -hmm. like that. And... um, I had inherited this because my boss quit and I took his job and I didn't want a straight quiz and that's how I changed it. But I kept the title because these little pamphlets were printed by the gas company and were all around the the, the state, so we had to keep the title, you see. And uh, the very first so-called visual radio stunt was the very first night. It was a very high-class thing. We gave a, a told a lady to sing the song Smiles. And at the end of each line, she was to put an ice cube in her mouth. Well, we would force it in. <laughs> and at the at, if you could still understand her, at the end of the song, she'd get $5. Well, how many ice cubes could she get in her mouth? <laughs> she about six. It was a... I'm not sure. She, I think her mother was frightened by Martha Ray <laughs> and had a rather large mouth. But anyway, that was the birth of, uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. of those wild stunt things. It was just that accident, uh, maybe it was fortuitous, of... Um, finding the book in the wrong place in the library. And that pullover neighbor went on for uh, two years. It was sponsored by an oil company, the Wilshire Oil Company here in Los Angeles and on the coast. And then it was canceled, and I sold it to um, Southern Pacific Railroad and called it All Aboard. And that (laughs) went for 26 weeks. And then that was canceled. And on this show, the MC was not Art Linkletter. It was uh, Art Baker. Uh-huh. Remember Art Baker? Sure, he was on. His uh, name was Art Shank then. Art Shank. Yeah, Art Shank uh, was a song leader for Amy Sample McPherson. And the way uh, we discovered him, uh, he actually was the host of the dramatic Forest Lawn shows at the time we started this quiz show. And the reason he was the host of the dramatic Forest Lawn show is that. He actually was the MC of the Last Supper window at Forest Lawn. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is they have a beautiful window out there, you know, and there's uh, all of the various uh, uh-huh. fellows sitting there at that last dinner, 
you know. <laughs> and uh, and he, he was the MC. He, he, people would come through <laughs> there during the day, and he'd explain all about the window. And my boss, Clyde Scott, when we were looking for an, a, a host for this show, for Forrest Lauder program, a dramatic program, he said, well, why don't we use the fellow that's already working there? He's personable and so forth. And that started him on his uh -huh. career, you know, because you could also get him cheap. <laughs> and uh, he later changed his name to Art Baker because he went to work for General Mills and they wanted to sing uh. for him with baking, you know. They thought that was kind of <laughs> cute. That's the advertising <laughs> agency mine. Uh, that really works. Though. Yeah. And um, so Art Baker was the uh -huh. MC for Full Over Neighbor for two and a half years. Then he was the MC for All Aboard for six months. And then the show was off the air and couldn't sell it. But... <clears throat> There was an advertising club luncheon, oh, somewhere in 1940, I guess it was. And I was sitting down at the table at the Biltmore Hotel, and uh, there were some pretty important executives around there, the president of the, uh, of the uh, Richfield Oil Company and the head of a bank and so forth, in the, mm -hmm. one of the front tables. And I was looking at them, and they were all drawing pictures on the table, doodling. You know, one draws sailor, and one draws stars, and... One draws some woody, a tree, and the man on the stage was making a pretty dull speech, you know. He was, you know, was just talking there. And so I wrote down a comment about these, what was going on. I wrote, people are funny. Just the phrase, people are uh -huh. funny, as a comment. Then I put, I, I made it big, lots of letters and big, thick letters, you know, made it look like a, the 20th Century Fox, you know, uh -huh. the, the, the <laughs> logo. And I thought, well, there's a, there's a, a theme for a program, human nature proving that people are funny. So um, what happened was I, I uh, thought I should have a psychologist on it, and, you know, and, and do a stunt and then have a, a psychologist analyze it, analyze it. And uh, I got a hold of a fellow at USC named Milton Metfessel, who was a very high-class psychologist down there, a uh, teacher. And he... Um, we made a record, and this record we made with Art Linkletter. Now that's where he comes into the picture. It's kind of interesting. I had a friend named Bruce Ells, and uh, Bruce was a bank examiner. And Bruce said, "Can I get into radio? I don't like to be a bank examiner." And I said, "I can get <laughs> you a job. I think with the head of mutual as a salesman, which shouldn't be too hard after all. Salesmen are on commission." And he said, good. So I got him this job, and he became their very best salesman. That's Mutual on the Coast. Mm -hmm. It was called Don Lee. It's a whole bunch of 30 stations on the coast. And he traveled a lot. And he came back from one of his trips, and he said, you know, last Sunday night in San Francisco, I was walking across the lobby of the Sir Francis Drake Hotel. And there's this young fellow who was interviewing people on a program he called Who's Dancing Tonight? Just standing there with a microphone talking to people. And I thought he's awful good and you ought to meet him. I think he's better than the fellow you have on, Art Baker. Art Shank. And uh, I said, sure, what's his name? He said, Art Linkletter. And I said, well, the next time you run into him up there, because he's a guy traveling, tell him to, next time he's in Los Angeles, I'd like to have lunch with him. And so he did set up such a lunch. And I met Art. He was standing by a lamppost out in front of the... Um, Belrose Grotto, and uh, I introduced myself, and we went in and hit it off right away, and uh, he had an idea for a psychology program called Meet Yourself, mm -hmm. and I had people are funny, so we joined forces and made this record. Well, <clears throat> the record wasn't very good. It was all right, but it was kind of a serious record, so I patched it in and took some of the old Pull over neighbor records, which were very funny, and interspersed them with the mm -hmm. link letter. People are funny record, and so it made it look like it had two MCs on it. We're back to Parks Johnson, <laughs> Wally Butterworth, you yeah. know, and uh, it was pretty long. And I played it for NBC, and they owned a half interest in the record and in the show because they put up fifteen dollars for the record, yeah. <laughs> and I put up fifteen dollars, so they owned half interest, and they sent the record to New York. And the New York man named Clarence Menzer, who was head of programming at NBC at that time, he turned it down. He says, it's too dull. That psychologist is too dull. And so I said, well, can I buy back NBC's half interest for $15? So he said, sure. So I gave him back the $15, and so <laughs> I then owned the whole show. 
All I did was cut the psychologist out of the show and make it shorter. We just didn't have him anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we had a pretty good record then. And, uh, you know, it didn't have a psychologist in it, and it was funny, and it had two MCs. And um, I took it to all three networks then. They all turned it down. <laughs> I took it around a lot of other places. About a year went by. And I read in the paper in March of 1942, that's right after the war started, the Daily Variety, Weekly Variety, had a front page story saying that the government gave the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company one week to get a program off the air. And not, not even one more broadcast. They had to have no more broadcasts because it was called Captain Flag and Sergeant Quirk. And that's a funny show. And they did not, during wartime, want to show or depict army officers fraternizing with enlisted men. Because that's what that did, Captain <coughs> Flag. That was based on the What Price Glory. What Price Glory, yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave him one week. Well, I'd been writing letters to everybody, President Roosevelt and Cecil DeMille, you know, yeah. and trying <laughs> to get something. And so I took this yellow sheet of paper and wrote, I have the answer to your problem, and sent it to the man's name of the agency, Russell uh, Tom Wallace, of the Russell Seeds Agency in Chicago, was mentioned in the article mm -hmm. as being involved. And um, <clears throat> I did feel I could afford to send a telegram because I sent out so many letters I saying, I have the answer to your problem, that I just sent letters, you know. <laughs> and that's all it says, I have the answer to your problem. And if it, so apparently they did have a quick problem, so they sent a wire back, what is it, on Monday. <laughs> and I sent them the record. And they got it on Wednesday. And uh, they said, how much do you want for it? And I said, we want $5,000 a week. And they said, we'll offer you $750. And I said, well, is um, that your rock top? <laughs> and uh, we argued a bit and ended up at $750 for four weeks. And we went on two days later. You see, we had to go on that Friday. We didn't see any of the people back east. We didn't see the agency people. We didn't see the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company people because the time was that they had live radio time coming up Friday go, at yeah. 6 o'clock yeah. on NBC and what's going to fill it. So they had this high-class $750 program called hmm. The People Are Funny. And uh, it was fair. Well, did you do that now with, uh, with both, one or two both MCs? MCs? Both MCs. Both MCs. Huh. Well, after two weeks... Baker informed me that he said, I am not going to work with that other fellow because that other fellow is a great ad libber and Baker mm -hmm. wasn't. Baker was a nice fellow, but you'd have to write down on cards, uh, yeah, that's what I would have said. And, yes, sir. And, Thank oh, you. The whole you'd, business. Yeah, yeah he uh -huh. he's a, was a good voice and good newscaster mm -hmm. and a real nice guy, except that he didn't ad lib. <clears throat> so he said, either he goes or I go. Now, Baker knew he had the strength because, after all, he was the one that was on the coast shows that had the good ratings and everything. And Linkletter is that new fella from San Francisco that nobody had ever heard of. And uh, the client said, uh, uh, take Baker, you know. you can't. We won't take except Linkletter. We'll accept Baker. So I talked to Art Linkletter, and I said, this guy is pulling a trick on us. He should have told us before it started because he knew before it started. But he felt if he got it on the air, why then he could make the deal. Yeah. You know? And so he did. So a link letter agreed to go back to San Francisco and write jokes for the show and stuff. For a, And I said, just bide your time. You'll get back on this show. And it took a year and a half. And the show bobbled along. It went pretty good. It went pretty good. It was a fairly good, successful show. But after about a year and a half, I felt that it's just, if we could have a guy that could ad-lib, we'd be so much better. And here's Linkletter up in San Francisco. And so I fired Baker. And um, he sued me for $100,000. Well, he really didn't have a right to, as far as I was concerned, because he had never contributed. He didn't own part of the show. He was hired as an MC. And Did and you have a contract with him? The contract was as an MC. Uh -huh. He says, oh, I know I can't <laughs> win on the lawsuit, but I just want to make it tough, you know. Well, was, did you fire him at the end of a at the end of the contract or in the in in the midst of it? Oh, I could fire him any thirteen week period. Oh, I see. I see, and this was one of them. Yeah, oh, it was I just. A, I told the client that I was going to, 
And then when he sued me, the client says, put him back, put him back. We don't want to be sued. Mm -hmm. But I said to the client, I said, well, I indemnify you anyway. The contract says, if, you know, the, the packager indemnifies the network and the packager indemnifies the, um, the client, mm -hmm. the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company. So I didn't have any money at all. We weren't making much money on this show. After all, we were making 750 in the beginning, and then it went up to 850 and then 1000 and so forth. And um, matter of fact, on the very fourth week of the show of that original contract, we got a wire from the president of the agency. He said, this is the one that counts. And I wired back. I said, I'm glad you sent the wire because we were going to try tonight. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, uh, the lawsuit went on. Linkletter went on the show. Mm -hmm. Baker was off. And it started to pick up. It started to pick up right away. And... Um, then uh, the lawsuit was a long-running thing, and it was hundred thousand dollars. That's you know, I had maybe five hundred dollars in the bank one month, and maybe two hundred uh, uh, two hundred fifty dollars. Really mm -hmm. running low, and so I wouldn't know where it's going to come from. But a year later, and was, the thing was set to go to the trial, jury trial. Baker's a nice white-haired guy and wonderful thing. <laughs> I am not just John Goodell, a, a packager. I am. National Broadcasting Company, Brown and Williamson Tobacco <laughs> Company, there he lumps them all together because uh -huh. they're all defendants. Uh -huh. They don't realize that there's only one guy taking the rap for these other two because of the indemnification clause. <clears throat> well, I sold a show to Pepsodent called the Charlotte Greenwood Show, and we were on our way to New York to set it up, and it was the summer of um, 44. And... Um, Art had gone on the show the previous October, so the suit was now about nine or ten months along, was ready to go to trial. And just casually, as we were going along about Cleveland, the lawyer for the Charlotte Greenwood people, the uh, Foot Corner Belly Advertising Agency, said, um, how you coming with that lawsuit Art Baker has against you? And I said, well, we're going to trial in next week. He said, well, he can't sue you. I says, he can't. I says, no, he says, I a star, an actor, cannot sue the producer without first going to arbitration. Says so on page 7 after code book, so and so and so and so. <laughs> now, this Martin Gang is a, is a show business lawyer. I'd made the mistake of getting a downtown lawyer, you know. Ah, a friend of the ah, family, ah. that sort of thing. He didn't know about the after thing. So I got off the train and I wired the, my lawyer. He says, look it up, page so and so and so and so and so and so. And so we did go to arbitration. And we won. Did you send your lawyer a fee then on that? <laughs> we had, um, <clears throat> our lawyer, the lawyer on the train, uh -huh. was was my arbitrator. Uh -huh. and then uh -huh. Baker had his arbitrator, and then there was a neutral arbitrator. Baker's arbitrator was a, a, a judge, Leroy Dawson, a very fine fellow, whom we immediately used on the program several times because mm -hmm. he was so funny. <laughs> and a real good guy. Good guy. But at any rate, um, that was uh, an incident there. And Baker and I became somewhat friends after that. He's passed away, I presume. He's, yes, he's, you know, some, he was on the, the television. Uh, uh, you asked you for asked it. For yeah. it. No, mm -hmm. you didn't have anything to do with no, that. No, I didn't have anything to do with anything he had to do with after <laughs> this particular situation. Well, then Art Linkletter came on the scene and he ran away with it, didn't he? Art Linkletter yeah. ran away with it, yes. he uh, It, it uh, really picked up, and that was in the fall of uh, 43 when Art went on, and that show went on 19 years. Um. The radio went from 1942 until 1954, 12 years, and then the television from 54 to 61. Mostly on radio, it was Raleigh Cigarettes, wasn't it? Or um, the tobacco company? <clears throat> yes, it was um, Raleigh and Cool, and yes. Uh -huh. that, and and then it was um, Milky Way candy bars mm -hmm. and the Mana Freezers and, and that sort of thing. It's odd. You were speaking of the visual things, why you do certain visual things. We were going to do a show at the Long Beach Municipal Auditorium, and we called uh, for a cow to be on the program. And Irvin Atkins, who was the guy that did everything on the show, mm -hmm. you know, you go get anything you want, uh, he um, went to the janitor, to the maintenance man at the um, auditorium, and says, This elevator is strong enough to hold a cow. And uh, he says it's strong enough to hold an elephant. 
So Herb says, told me the story. He says, well, let's get an elephant instead. <laughs> so that's how we happen to have an elephant on <laughs> instead of a cow. And it, it's amazing how this picked up around the country. He says, they put a, an elephant on the radio. Because there's something about it when the audience saw them, when the contestants saw them, it went through their voices and things. Now, this was probably a rather small elephant. Not as big as this room. The elephant was? Sure. Full-size elephant. Oh, all right. Now, if we can get a full-size <laughs> elephant for the same price as a little elephant, we're going to get a full-size well, elephant. Well, I was wondering, you see, the listener at home, you know, he, his imagination is working. You're saying, here's an elephant. Oh. And he's saying it could be as big an elephant as he wanted it to be. But you didn't really have to have it. But because of the studio audience, you wanted to get that reaction. <clears throat> well, if you're going to go for that far down, you could go down to a little Pekingese and say, this is an elephant. The audience would just laugh, you know, and everything. <laughs> yeah. But no, actually, we tried uh -huh. to make it as... Um, the imagination helped an awful yeah. lot. Because there's a funny thing. You know, we do those outside stunts where you send somebody out and then bring them back. And the reason, one of the reasons the network people turned that show down originally is they said, you mean you give a man outside to do something and you never cut outside with a tape machine or, I mean, with a record or listen to it and uh, you never uh, do anything till he comes back? And I said, did you just hear what happened? And he said, said, that's right. He says, that won't work. You've got to hear him while you're outside. Well, I said, no, that won't work, because first place, it interrupts what you're doing on stage. Mm -hmm. The second place, actually, it's not very good. The imagination and how they tell it of what hap really happened is, yeah. is, is concise at the end, whereas if it had been picked up here and there, you know, there's nothing so dull as an open mic on a street before anything is edited. Yeah. They just, yeah. Ah, hey, 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 hey. Yeah. now we'll go back to them in a few minutes, yeah. you know. <laughs> Well, it used to be fun, though, because he'd cut away, he'd send them out, and then say, say goodbye to them, audience, isn't that yeah, what the yeah. art used to say? And then uh, you'd almost forget about them, yeah. except maybe somewhere you might announcer or somebody them, yeah. might mm -hmm. make a mention of it. And then when they'd come back, you know, mm -hmm. you'd be really excited about hearing what they were saying. Yeah. And if someone outside who was participating in the stunt, He's you brought. know, and they bring them back yeah. and then they tell about their reaction. It really was. Yes, when you bring an extra person back that was they found out there, that helped yeah. a lot. That helped a lot, yeah. yeah. I often had a guy in the bed at the corner of Hollywood and Vine or <laughs> sleeping out there or waving a, hog, a car that would growl at people or something yeah. like that. It's fantastic. Who thought up all of the stunts? Oh, we had, um, I was principally a writer. Because I used to write well, Laurel and Hardy comedies. Uh, you did? Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, our gang. and That's what I did before I got into uh, radio. I got fired six, six times from Hal Roach Studios. Every time Mr. Roach would want to go to Alaska to hunt bear, um, <laughs> pretty chilly up there, uh, he um, would close the studio. And so we'd all get fired. The writers would get fired. And then um, we'd come back, and um, he'd come back and open the studio work again, you know. And so fired six times in three and a half years or this radio came along, I thought that would be a good idea, <laughs> you know. How did how would you write I, I have to step aside from the, this for a moment. How did you how did you write the material for Laurel and Hardy? I mean did you give them an outline and they just took it away? Oh no no really Oh or? no, they had a script, sort of mm -hmm. and a storyline and a dialogue. It looked something like a script. There was an awful lot of work done on the set. And Laurel was brilliant, and he mm. did a lot of improvisation, and you just kind of help out after they're on the set. The the writing that was done more uh, followed directly was for the Charlie Chase, the Thelma Todd, and uh, Patsy Kelly comedies, mm -hmm. the R Gang. Mm -hmm. And um, the R Gangs were tough to do because, you know, they always did everything as a group. The the gang thinks some way. Now, you know, that's seven kids doing the same thing. They go in and out of a door all together. Uh -huh. it's, it's it's awkward, and it looked awkward. Uh -huh. But the things were fairly successful. You worked only on the comedies, and, I mean, the shorts, not... Uh, no, I worked features. on the Bohemian Girl did feature you? and a General Spanky, which did 65% of normal business that year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Photoplay would list all of the shows, uh -huh. all the movies. Uh -huh. San Francisco was at the top in 1936, and there was about seven columns, and we were second from the bottom with General Spanky. <laughs> we beat out Jack Haley and Mexican Hayride. <laughs> I think he did 62% of all that. be glad to be reminded of that. Yeah, I'm, yes. Uh, well, at any rate, you, your original question about people are funny. Um, 
<clears throat> Jack Stanley, who recently passed away, this fellow I knew at UCLA, and he was just crazy. You know, he'd wear a coonskin cap with a with a thing hanging down the front, and he'd go to all of UCLA football games. He'd have a trumpet and yell charge. That kind of a fella. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, he later became a writer, and as you can and on people are funny. And um, then there was. Uh, who else? Lou Shore was a writer, wasn't he? Young people are funny. My father. My father. Really? Oh, yes. I'd hired him, and he was a writer and sort of a production man for years. And he was still on the show when it went off, and he was 75 years old then. Oh, great. Well, on the house party show, yes. Yes. We're getting and, some um, aside help from Mrs. Yes. Goodell. Yeah, why don't you come over here, honey? You can help me out here. <laughs> some of this stuff. Come on. Come on over here. We're chatting yeah. in the Goodell yes. living room here. Yeah, Mrs. Goodell is, uh, uh, was cut in half by Blackstone for eight years on the road. She hasn't suffered a bit yes, by it yes. either. <laughs> <laughs> you were also a contestant on uh, Groucho Marx's program. Yes, I was. Yeah, that was before the uh, infamous sawing in half. Right, about two years before. Oh, good. Well, she suffered. She looks pretty good today. Yes, the, the Band-Aids don't show. <laughs> Well, we bring up You Bet Your Life because you produced that program. Yes, that came about rather interestingly, I thought. That um, overlapped, people are funny, as well as uh, the house party overlapped them both, you know. Um, I think the entrance, uh, house shows start are of interest. I think, for example, how house party started was of, 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 of interest because uh, a lot of people listening to the radio say, well, how can I get into these things mm -hmm. and how do these things happen? told you how the chance of people are funny reading it in the paper you didn't need an agent you just be alert to what's going on right time now let's, let's <clears throat> set the scene for a second the house party was uh art link letter was the host of that and that was a daily show. every day in yes. the afternoon yes uh-huh uh -huh. yes. audience it, participation yes. they ran 26 years and was one of the top three programs longer than any other daytime program so it was had a mm -hmm. highly successful rate it was on cbs most of the time it was on abc a while uh, how did it get started <clears throat> well I had sold a show to International Silver through Young and Rubicum called The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet mm -hmm. uh, in the summertime of uh, the year of 44. And uh, I went to New York, and it was around noon. I went up to Young and Rubicum, which is the advertising agency, uh, and to meet the fellows that had bought the show over the phone. You know, I'd sent them a record, and, you know, we got mm -hmm. back and forth. And um, they... It was empty, except for one fellow named Stanley Joseloff that was sitting there. And I said, where is everybody? He said, they're all out to lunch. I said, well, um, you must be buying something. He says, no, we're very happy. Everything's fine. We have, we're have we not interested in any kind of programs of any kind. I says, what's <laughs> that note on your desk, which I was reading upside down? <laughs> Dick Powell audition 1030. He says, you read that upside down? I says, yeah. <laughs> he says, well, that's all set. And I says, what do you mean? He says, well, tomorrow morning... Dick Powell is auditioning a musical show for General Electric, and the time's already bought, and it's all set to go on January 15th. And uh, this was, well, I guess this must have been about September, October at the time. And uh, I said, it's all set, but they haven't actually bought it. And he says, no, they haven't bought it, but they're <laughs> tomorrow morning at 10.30, they're going to buy it. He said, if I come to you for something you like better between now and not tomorrow morning at 10.30, will you, um, is it eligible? He says, oh, sure, sure. You, <laughs> you know, we're all set, Dick Powell, big star and everything. So I said, okay, I'll be back. And so I went back to the hotel, and I called Linkletter in San Francisco. Now, he was commuting to do People Are Funny every week. I said, would you like to come and live in Los Angeles? He said, sure. Why? I said, well, we've got this maybe five-day-a-week show for General Electric. And, um, and he said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, uh, I don't know, we'll figure out something, it's, you know, some <laughs> daytime show. And uh, I had wanted to do kids. And actually, I stole the idea from Quiz Kids in this, this fashion. Quiz Kids were on the radio, and once a week at night. And I said out loud one time, I said, you know, it seems to me that if the public could identify with ordinary kids, uh, they would like them as well or better than, identif than with these real brilliant kids. It'd be, hey, that, that, in other words, a kid just like their own mm -hmm, on the mm -hmm, radio yeah. in preference to a, a brilliant kid, you know. And uh, so I, we, Art liked that idea. And we'd been kicking that around. 
uh, and uh, we made a, a record of it called Paging Young America, designed for nighttime ordinary kids, Art Linkletter. And uh, so I said, I've got to use that somehow. But, of course, you can't have five half hours of kids because they have to go to school. So what I did is I went and made a calendar and put the kids five minutes each day and then filled out the rest from stuff out of the woman's books. We'll have a hairstylist. We'll have a homemaker thing. We'll have so forth. And the thing that sold it to General Electric was that we'll pretend we're in a different room of the house, and we'll call it open house. And when we are in the kitchen, we'll talk about your kitchen appliances. And when we're on the um, uh, bedroom, they have some bedroom appliances. Mm -hmm. And in the living room, they'd have the radio and the tele the, you know, the, the things. Yeah. Uh -huh. And they, they, they thought that was clever, you know, just one thing like that from a commercial point of view. Because we're not anywhere. It's your radio imagination, you know. And we'd have sets built, we'd say, and have them. And so they walk around and hit the things. And, and at any rate, uh, Linkletter was doing well on People Are Funny, so they liked the MC. And uh, we, they didn't buy us, but they didn't buy uh, Dick Powell, Dick Powell. Mm -hmm. see. And they paid for an audition, and we made one, and we went on the air. And, uh, you know, in other words, if you're in there at the last minute, uh, and, of course, our price yeah. is better, too. <laughs> well, you know, we, we didn't have Well, you see, thing. the big thing, though, was the... Timing. Uh, well, well, yeah, but getting, going to the heart of it with the sponsors. This is how we're going to... Yeah, it's your product. Yes, <laughs> yes, and they 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 thought yeah. that was good because instead of just stopping something, I said we'll mingle it in, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, um, there was one interesting thing that one fellow I think I don't know whether he got fired or not, but they weren't going to introduce a coffee maker, and they took us on tour for 19 weeks. But this one particular week, they're going to introduce the coffee maker. They chose Salt Lake City. And we were going to give coffee makers to every contestant. And all this big thing and all the coffee makers. And the very first contestant says, here's your coffee maker. Says, I'm a Mormon. I don't drink coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs> every person in that audience was a Mormon. Every person in that audience all week long was a Mormon. This is the only major city in the United States we could have picked where they don't drink coffee as our coffee maker launcher. Isn't that something? <laughs> well, uh, you were back to... Um, Back to the uh, Groucho thing. Oh, well, I, listen, and, we're uh, just jumping around. Yeah, right. let's see. Now, House Party did, of course, make a very easy transition to television, too. Oh, yes. yes. And, House uh, Party went on uh, radio in 45, and it went on radio until, um, oh, it overlapped mm -hmm. television by some 15 years. We had both on, simulcast. Yeah. And um, I guess radio went from 45 to about 65, and television went from... 52 to 70. So the the run was 26 years. Did the GE start, start it on television too? Did no. They the no, TV? GE started on radio mm -hmm. and um, they had a strike shortly after we went on and uh, they lo we lost them as a sponsor and then we were on co-op for a while with McMahon Furniture and some others and then we... Um, we really got Pillsbury. Pillsbury was mm -hmm. the key sponsor of the radio okay. show. And um, that was an interesting sale. Uh, I had heard on the street, on uh, Vine Street, uh, just happened to meet a fella, and um, I said, you know, House Party isn't sponsored. And he says, well, why don't you talk to Bill Waddell? He can sell anything. It was a, it was a Leo Burnett agency in Chicago, mm -hmm. and he was the head of their radio. And um, I said, well, I'm going to Europe, and I'm going through Chicago on Sunday, and I'll see if I can call him. And he said, well, there's a possibility they're looking around for something for Pillsbury. They're going to buy a um, K. Kaiser. Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, okay. And so I got off the train at one station when you get through with the super chief and called Waddell. And uh, there's only five Waddells in the Chicago phone book. And one of them looked like he'd be an ad agency man because it said Hillsdale. And, you know, it <laughs> sounds like where an ad agency man would live. And the other looked, you know, it said Cicero and 14th <laughs> Street and other things. And I didn't feel an ad agency man would live there. So I called the Hillsdale number, which was, ex it was extra, it was 40 cents. Uh -huh. And they didn't answer. So I went over to the other station. Now, this is how, how on what's a fine line a sale can be made uh -huh. or lost. I went over to the other station which was the um, train to go to New York, and called again just before the train left. 
and let it ring and ring and ring and said, operator, give me my money back. He said, wait a minute, here's your party. And it was Bill Waddell. And I introduced myself and said, um, and here again, they were just about to buy something. He said, well, we're going to Minneapolis to uh, sign up the um, K. Kaiser show for Pillsbury on uh, Tuesday. And uh, can you make us a definite offer? And this thing sounds good. I'd like to talk about it. I said, well, General Foods has a, um, Young Rubicum has an option for 90 days. He said, well, that's out. I said, however, Pat Weaver's a nice fella, and when I'm in New York tomorrow, I'll try to get him to lift it. Then you can make the offer. And so he said, fine. And, you know, Weaver said um, next day, he was head of Young and Rubicum Radio. And uh, he said, uh, I, we got 90 days, huh? And I says, yeah. And he says, well... I only got two clients, Borden and General Foods. He says, I'll call them both up now. He says, you don't want to buy that show, do you? And he says, no. He says, Nicole, he says, you know, you have to buy it right now or else or something. You know, he, mm -hmm. he just kind of fuddled yeah. with the executives, and they were really interested. He says, okay, 90 days is off. Go ahead. Isn't that oh, nice of it? Super, yeah. Yeah, you know, they could have held on and yeah. fussed around and made presentations, but they didn't have any real prospects. Those were their two mm -hmm. big people in that. And so um, I called Bill Waddell, and... We talked every once in a while. I went to Europe. We talked from Scotland and talked from from Germany and talked. And finally, in Switzerland, the deal was all set. <laughs> and Link was in Rome, so I called him. It was very, very international on that thing. <laughs> and Pillsbury, yeah. you know, they bought the whole show, and they were wonderful, wonderful outfit. And they were with us all the way through uh, radio and television until it was off. They didn't have the whole show in television. Nobody mm -hmm. buys the whole yeah. show in television. Yeah. The last thing is the Groucho thing, and you're running out of your time here, I see. you got about right. five minutes. <laughs> it started in an interesting way. Ever the way. producer. Ever yeah. the producer. Well, uh, <clears throat> there was a, a Walgreen two-hour radio show on once a year to, for a penny sale, and they got a lot of people that were stars. The, a radio spectacular, I guess you'd mm -hmm. call it. And Linkletter was called to do a People Are Funny stunt, and I was the producer, and so I was there, and I held the needle, which was to hand to Linkletter, which was to hand to uh, Cesar Romero, who was blindfolded, who was supposed to put a patch on the seat of a contestant's pants. It was a very high-class stuff. <laughs> but I was sitting there in the audience watching Bob Hope and Groucho Marx reading a script, mm -hmm. funny stuff, and Bob dropped his script by accident. So Groucho dropped his script on purpose, and they were much, much funnier with their scripts dropped than they were reading the mm -hmm. stuff. And afterwards, I went up to Groucho, whom I didn't know, and said, you know, hiring you to read a script is like buying a Cadillac for the purpose of hauling coal. You don't utilize mm -hmm. your abilities. And he'd flopped four times on the radio. And... Uh, I said, you want to do a quiz show? He says, you mean compete with refrigerators? And I said, yeah. He says, well, I've flopped four times so far. What can I lose? And that's how we went mm -hmm. in business together to do this particular show, which was a rebirth for him because he was oh, 57 yeah. years uh -huh. old then. And uh, I, we made that show for $250 and the radio record. And I took it to all the networks. They all turned it down and because they said Groucho's flopped four times on the radio. So then, I read in the paper, here's the reading the variety again, <laughs> that Alan Gelman, president of Elgin American Compact Company of Chicago, is coming to the Beverly Hills Hotel to sign up Phil Baker for his <laughs> new quiz show, Everybody Wins. So he's going to, see? So I called up Mr. Gelman at the Beverly Hills. I said, have you signed up Phil Baker yet? He says, no. I said, I want you to hear a record. So I took the record up to his room and played it. And he didn't know Groucho had flopped four times on the radio. He says, this is a funny record. I remember him in the coconuts. There's a pretty mm -hmm. funny by man, you know. <laughs> okay. And they <coughs> made the deal. And Phil Baker fired his press agent. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's how, it, how, how the thing got on. You aced him out every time, didn't you? Well, I mean, just no, just by not every time. I'm telling you about the successes. <laughs> you want to talk about the failures. What was your most spectacular failure? Um, I think the Jackie Coogan show was. Uh, because um, it was it was on 13 weeks, but they changed agencies before it went on, and it was canceled before it went on. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, the 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 uh, McCann agency bought it, and um, then the uh, they had a party 
for the Bromo Seltzer people to come up to New York, and Jackie Coogan didn't get to mm -hmm. the party, and it was for him, and so they changed agencies anyway to BBD and O, and uh, BBD and O um, canceled the show at the request of the Emerson Drug Company before it went on. So here we go on with 13 weeks with a show that was already canceled, and um, it, uh, if it had been a big smash. Mm -hmm. It would help, but it doesn't help the morale of the of the actors. Say, all right, we're going into a show that's canceled. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> over before we. Start and it started now. in April, and yeah. it was eight o'clock on Monday night, and there was too uh, much daylight. And anyway, it wasn't it wasn't very good. It wasn't bad. It was a comedy show, a half hour of Jackie Coogan in a drugstore talking in a high voice, forever. <laughs> and Lorene Tuttle was good. Oh, yeah. She played a little girl. And uh, it wasn't bad compared to situation comedies, but it was a spectacular failure, I would say. <laughs> well, your your uh, the lids off wasn't were. very good either with Art Linkletter, but that was 10:30 uh, at night, and the title said we were going to be real X-rated. Well, Art isn't a very X-rated yeah. guy, uh, you know. And the publicity department of ABC took off the lids off, you know, <laughs> and uh, we uh, the lid was on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, your successes far outnumber your failures. And well, at least I talk about them. Groucho. Uh, the Groucho thing was on radio first for a couple of years before it went. Three into years. TV. Three years on radio, and then um, eleven on television. Yeah. Did it go into television with Elgin American or right away with the? Uh, oh no, Elgin American was only on. They'd go on for twenty-six weeks and then try to get out for the. See, they only had Christmas selling. Oh, I see. And f we just fussed along with them, and they were nice people because mm -hmm. they started us. But it was um, DeSoto, uh, mm -hmm. Chrysler, uh, Plymouth, Chrysler yeah. Plymouth, that really took over there. Yeah. And they kept it for a long while, and we ran DeSoto out of business. In other words, <laughs> you know, they, so that they didn't uh, made it an extinct car by having so many people. Actually, it wasn't the right product. Here we had a very large mass audience, a number one, number two show in radio and television, and a $6,000 item. Mm -hmm. So we figured Tony and Lever Brothers and those people, those are the ones that could use it, and those are the ones that finally got it. Uh -huh. And we're yeah. getting it again because yes, it's, we have the best of Groucho all you, over the place. You got, it, you got it in Chicago, uh -huh. and, uh, and it's, it's in a lot of other stations, and it's got a lot of young people never saw Groucho right. before are interested in that, which is interesting because he's lemon, you know. He, he's, uh, he's bitter on the outside and bitter on the inside. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, and he. Not, yeah, but everybody he's loves a balloon the, the Marx Brothers movies, and yeah. they're enjoying him on. That's television. right. Yeah, that's, that's really right. Good. Yeah. You've done a great job with uh, your career over all these years, and I think you've had a good time with it too. Haven't oh, you? I think it's been a lot of fun. It's certainly been a lot of fun, and I'm still trying. What are you going to do next? Uh, try to get out of the electronic business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got a nice little business on the side that you're yeah, trying to get yeah, out of. Yeah, huh? <laughs> nice little. Yeah, no. I don't want to hear about well, it. I have to go back into television to make up the losses in the electronic. I have advice to all you uh, listeners, if you're still with us, <laughs> stay with what you know. <laughs> Thank well, all right. Let's stay with what you know. Well, could you do an audience participation show on radio today? Would you like to do one? Oh, I think people could. We do could. It? Yeah, sure. I'm, I think people could do that because uh, radio is basically talk. And if you have, uh, if your units are short enough, mm -hmm. you see, radio apparently works in a sh much shorter memory span than it used to. Everything's got to be little units that you can catch in the car. And, and have you ever noticed that they don't seem to have very long things on radio? I mean, some places we try to take a little more time because yeah. our chat here is going to play intact without without being broken. Oh, well, that's so nice. we'll well, that's that. forty minutes. That's right. Good. <laughs> well, thank you, John. John Goodell, thanks very much. We appreciate being with you today. All right, thank you.